Good morning and welcome to the City of Santa Monica's opening ceremony for Black History Month. We're excited to have you join us today for this special occasion and we hope you enjoy today's ceremony. I'm Stephen Torrance and I serve as the Emergency Services Administrator within the Office of Emergency Management. With today marking my one year anniversary with the City of Santa Monica, it is truly an honor and privilege to join you as MC for today's ceremony. In addition to my former role with the city, I also serve as an equity and inclusion officer and a member of the city's racial equity committee. Celebrating black history and family are two major parts of my life. I was born to a family where my two grandmothers gave birth to a combined 21 children. Needless to say, family was all we had and needed. Hailing from two music meccas, the Boogie Down Bronx and the jazz laden streets in New Orleans, my family knew that music, family, food, tradition, and culture should be shared and celebrated at all times. My family's history is one of the many reasons why I'm excited for today's ceremony. It's no mistake we're holding the ceremony this for the second year in a row on Rosa Parks Day. Rosa Parks is a reminder to each of us that we can challenge oppressive and unequal ideologies, resist norms and practices which have been in place for far too long, yet continue to celebrate the strength and individuality of our communities. We honor Rosa Parks as, uh, and many of our other civil rights icons, including Claudette Colvin, who was also arrested for not giving up her seat on the bus at the age of 15. Minister and activist C.T. Vivian and the late Congressman John Lewis, who all fought tirelessly for the equal rights of black families. Though we've come a long way since 1964, 2020 reminded us that our community and nation have a long way to go and we must continue to carry the torch in the fight for racial equity. COVID-19 continues to remind us that where we live, the jobs we have, and a, and a history of mistrust in the medical community disproportionately expose members of the black community to COVID-19 and a death rate of nearly three times that of white Americans. The death of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey crushed our souls, but still we rise, fight and demand an equal and reformed justice system, which truly serves black people, includes black people, and responds not in jest to the needs of black people. Unfortunately, because we were virtual this year, the amazing smell of soul food under the midday sun won't hug your soul the same way, the drum beats won't hit the same way, and the songs of our black ancestors won't stop people from walking down Main Street. But we are resilient. We are still one city, we are still one community, and one family who are coming together to celebrate the black family. Before we move into the ceremony, I would like to share on behalf of the production team and today's participants that all filming for this event was carried out in accordance with the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health's COVID-19 safety protocols. Participants who are live are either coming to you from their homes or offices where they are a safe di distance away from non-household members or utilizing personal protective equipment. As we begin to celebrate the Black family, culture, and history, it is my honor to invite our first guest, an, an artist who goes by the name of Cozy, to lead us in the singing of Lift Every Voice and Sing, also known as the Black National Anthem. Cozy is a fresh developing artist who is a native of the Los Angeles area. She released a, her first single called Mystery, which you can listen to on Apple Music and Spotify. She was a genre building and free spirited artist focused on uplifting the African American community as well as her own story. Please welcome Cozy. Lift every voice and sing. Till earth and heaven ring, ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song 
full of the hope that the present has brought us facing the rising sun of our new day begun let us march on till victory is won stony the road we tried bitter the chastening rod felt in the days when hope unborn had died yeah with the steady beat have i not a weary feet come to the place for which our father sighed we have come over a way that with tears has been watered we have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughter out from our gloomy past till now we stand at last where the white gleam of our bright star is cast god of our weary years god of our silent tears thou who has brought us thus far on the way thou who has by thy mind led us into the light keep us forever in the path we pray lest our feet stray from the places our god where we met thee lest our hearts drink from the wine of the world we forget thee shadow beneath thy land may we and true to our God, true to our native land. Good morning. My name is Delena Benacama, and I'm the Equity and Communications Coordinator for the City of Santa Monica. I'm also a member of the City's Government Alliance on Race and Equity. I co-lead the city's racial equity committee as well as lead citywide racial equity work. This is the second year I've had the privilege to collaborate with staff and community members to spearhead the planning for Black History Month. Today our program is focused on the Black family, our diversity, representation, and identity. It's important to understand that the Black community is a group of diverse people from all around the world. We're born with various skin colors, hair textures, and physical features. We even speak different languages, including indigenous languages of Africa and the Americas and other regions, English, Pidgin English, Patois, French, Creole, Spanish, Portuguese, and so many others. Although we come from different cultures, we have many shared experiences because of the color of our skin. We also share a spiritual connection that is intrinsically ingrained in our souls. That connection is so profound that when we cross paths with one another, no matter the city, the state, country, or continent, we somehow feel at home. Today, you will have a chance to see the diversity of our community, and you will hear directly from Black community members who will share their family history and contributions to Santa Monica. You will also learn about Black family food traditions. And as we all know, food is an important component of one's culture. So I'm excited for you to hear these community member stories. But before we begin, I wanna tell you a quick story of my own. As some of you may know, I'm half African-American and half Nigerian. I truly believe I hit the jackpot in terms of culture. I was raised in Louisiana by my African-American mother, and she is truly one of the best cooks I know. Trust me. I seriously lick my plate clean, clean when eating her food. She sets the bar high, very high, for anyone cooking Southern cuisine. 
and she taught me and my siblings how to cook at a young age. On occasion, I have had to call her to refresh my memory about dishes I haven't cooked in a while. My dad, who is Nigerian, makes the best banga soup, and I love when he cooks plantain with our meals. And my godfather, Frank Levingston Jr., who I also grew up with in Louisiana, made the best fried chicken and Southern style vegetable soup. He even had a snack cupboard for me and my siblings to raid every time we visited. Although he passed away in 2016 at the age of 110, he continues to be an important influence on my life. He was the oldest World War II veteran before he passed away, a devout Muslim, an active member of the Nation of Islam. And he did quite well in life despite being born during the Jim Crow era, despite struggling aside fellow African-Americans who were the last ones hired, but the first ones fired during the Great Depression, despite serving in a segregated army unit during World War II, and despite living through so many other hardships because of the color of his skin. Thinking about my godfather and his experiences, as well as those of my mom and dad, is a reminder that we've made many advancements, but we still have a long road to travel to achieve racial equity. When I think of food, I think of the memories made with my loved ones and the knowledge imparted as we all enjoy the food. One of my favorite Nigerian dishes besides my dad's banga soup is a goosey soup. I have not found a restaurant that can match my cousin's cooking in Nigeria. And some of my favorite Cajun Creole foods are boudin and crawfish etouffee. And during this time of year, I especially love to eat gumbo with chicken, seafood, and sausage. And of course, I love my food to be spicy. I really hope you enjoy the program today as we all learn something new about Black culture through community stories. Our first family food tradition will be shared by Arts Commissioner Angela Scott, followed by a dance performance by African Soul LA. Food is one of the most pivotal things in our family. On Christmas Eve, it's our gumbo day. That is the day that we make gumbo together. Like that is our family thing. We make gumbo together and you know, we're all in the kitchen chopping it up and, and getting all the ingredients together. My mom's got a stock pot this high, no lie, because everybody's like, oh, that's right. Mrs. Pennywell's making gumbo, we're coming over. But it's usually that time where the family gets together and we just have our family talks everybody's lives revolve around food. And it's just wonderful when you hear everybody's different journeys that they take with food, because food can be a journey, and it's always a journey that brings on so many memories. I'm African-American, of course, but I also have, on my dad's side, we're mixed with Caribbean, we're Dominican and Puerto Rican. So what I made today is like a party platter, right? We've got the Dominican rice, the moro de guancoles, with the uh, pigeon peas, right? And then we have the flan, which is our showstopper dessert. Very light, light flavor tasting. It's not heavy on your stomach. And then we have the main meal, the pernil, which is our roasted pork, uh, Dominican again. Um, and it's, it has the, the skin itself very crispy, very savory. It was matted and marinated in garlic and vinegar and olive oil and peppers and just wonderful, wonderful spices and juices. Because these are generational stories, these are generational recipes that you share. Because we all came here to America, but everybody had a different journey. And so to understand that and to bring it into past you know, to bring in, like you say, the ethnic culture, North African culture, to bring in the Caribbean culture, to bring in, you know, any type of uh, Latin American culture and understanding that we all are still a part of the African diaspora. And so to celebrate it all in its beauty is the best thing that we could ever do because at the end of the day, we all want to feel included.
As you will see, we really represent the Black family through our culture. Um, African Soul really strives to preserve and present the rich history of the African and African American experience. So it is very much our tradition that we have the babas drumming, that we have the mamas dancing, and even the children, even the young people. Dance is, of course, it's a cardiovascular activity, but it's also a family and community activity. It's a way to bring everyone together. The heart rhythm, the, the stress de, uh, is alleviated when you hear the drums and when you play the drums. So it's all actually therapeutic, but it's just really just a staple of our culture. So you're gonna see two different dances today. One is a dance of the harvest because the young people are our harvest. Everything that we work for, everything that we toil for, all of our struggles. It's really so that we can create a better, um, a better life for our next generation. The second dance is a celebration dance because this is Black History Month. So we wanna celebrate. We wanna let everyone know um, the positive of who we are in our culture. I think it's such a great time because people are actually very interested in knowing not only African-Americans, but other people too. And so we really like to just stress and teach the positives of Black history and of Black culture. We do it through dance, we do it through song, we do it through rhythm, but we also have some great instructional tools as well that people can find on our website. As a matter of fact, we have a free ebook, 28 Days of Black History Facts, so that you will know a different Black History Fact each and every day. What a great performance by African Soul International. We will now hear from educator, Dr. Shirley Compton, followed by the Seifu family, who will give us an introduction into Ethiopian cuisine. Well, my grandmother's father were uh, a part of the first African-Americans allowed to buy a house in Santa Monica. Um, during about World War II times, was just about eight houses up from the 10 freeway when the 10 freeway wiped out quite a few of their friends. One of my gra great grandfathers has a tombstone right here at Woodlawn Cemetery on 14th Street in Pico. Uh, his birthday is July 4th, 1885. And he passed away in 1971. Um, and, and again, I just think that's such an awesome, resilient life. And to live and thrive in Santa Monica uh, for, for, for that long, and, and my son continue that legacy, that's what I love most about my family. My father, uh, his four siblings, all five of them would share books. I'll, I'll always remember them sharing Agatha Christie mystery novels throughout my life in the house. 
Uh, my grandmother loved Harry Potter books, which I thought was very interesting, um, especially in her like 70s. Um, so I would say that they shaped my love for, for literacy, for reading, for school, for learning. Um, my curiosity was piqued uh, by my family's interest in stories. African-Americans have been uh, high achievers academically out here. All five of my grandmother's children had really high academic scores in school. Uh, everyone continues to tell me I come from a really smart family, highly literate. Um, and they all were smart enough to take advantage of the opportunities. They went to Santa Monica College, got trades. Um, one of my aunts was the first African-American woman to run for mayor. She didn't win, but I think that's awesome. A lot of our African-American families out here are multicultural and believe in um, a global perspective. For instance, my son is bilingual. So we took advantage of Edison Elementary and the Immersion Program through John Adams and through Santa Monica High. Each and every one of us to engage our youth, to continue to engage our youth. That's how you sustain a city. That's how you sustain your family. That's how you sustain a community in mind. There's a quote that I like to use or close with from Dr. Marimba Ani's book. She says, as African scholars, it is our responsibility uh, to utilize the energies of our people. And that's pretty much, I think, what the black community in Santa Monica, especially those of us who went through the school system, um, that's pretty much what we believe in. Um, identifying and utilizing the energies of our people to liberate our people. very important to cook at home, to be healthy. My kids like it. Uh, yeah, they don't like the outside uh, uh, food, so they like to eat home cook. It's the, this dish is very special for us. Uh, we always use ours, the, you know, the bread, the Spanish, they use the bitter bread, or the Arabic people, they use bitter bread. We use the injera always. It's Without sauce. injera, we cannot. <laughs> no one day. We use always. So this is very important for us. Uh, it's vitamin A. And when someone uh, sick with the sugar, uh, you want to eat uh, no sugar, so what do you do here? Whole wheat. So as whole wheat, this is very, very good. We choose our food to uh, cook at home. Uh, most of uh, the uh, time is to save money and then also healthy. The most important is very healthy food. My dad, he likes to invite people. It's, uh, uh, it's uh, around to go to the village. So the people, the farmers, they sell stuff and it's too late for them. They cannot go anywhere. So they ask us, can we sleep over? And he call, he brings them over and they stay with us and eat together with them. decorated Olympian and the fastest woman of all time. We also have the opportunity to hear from downtown Santa Monica Commissioner Erica Leslie about her special greens recipe. Let's listen in to see what they had to say. My family is a, a basic working class family, grew up in Watts, which is known today as South Los Angeles. My mother was an RN. Uh, head nurse of California Hospital back in the 50s and 60s. Before that, she was a colonel in the Army. My father was a steel fabricator. And through our household and our outlining community, close neighbors, close-knit community, cousins, friends, and so forth, and it was just uh, a basic, solid uh, gatherness of community, love, discipline, and the priority was education for empowerment of a better generation. Well, I discovered art when I was at the age of seven. My mother had an antique 
teak wood armoire and I took a safety pin and I sketched out a desert scene, not knowing I kind of damaged an antique. However, my mother, she put it in a constructive manner, got me art supplies, and from then on, I found my art, my calling. From the military, I became acquainted with the Santa Monica community and became a residence there. And through there, my second family being the veteran community, I served in the U.S. Navy. I would provide therapeutic art sessions to fellow veterans dealing with PTSD and other stress-related conditions. From that point, when I left the Navy, retired from it, I then uh, structured with the West, West Los Angeles VA Healthcare Center. And from that point, the Recreational Department incorporated my uh, art therapy sessions to the VA. And so now the veteran community can come to the VA where I would provide art therapy sessions four times a year. When I create my art, such as uh, Flojo, which illustrate the watchtowers, and then the waves of Santa Monica, me being a resident, and then her legendary images of speed and grace and beauty. And then uh, at the same time, creating the praises of men and women of past and present wars. When Joseph completed the painting, she looked at me, she says, uh, what should you think I should name this? I just glanced, oh, that's the price of freedom. Because a lot of people don't understand what it, what it entails to be an American and have this liberties that we have in this country. Somebody had to pay the price, and the price was paid with blood. I love this one. When she got done with it, she says, what, what, what should I call it? I said, Phil, that's easy. She said, what do you mean easy? I said, who's that? She said, that's Flojo. Is that her first head? I said, yeah. What's she doing? She's running. I said, look at her. She's flowing. So instead of saying Flojo, just say, Joe's flow. Art is not a luxury. Art is therapeutic. Art is inviting everyone to within their own internal discovery of uniqueness within them. Whether you perfect the art or not, to engage in art is very uh, reflecting. And at the same time, through these difficult times, we must also be not distracted by negative, hate, whatever the case where it's coming from, but to stand strong and stay independent and be self-reliant and at the same time, reach out and, and connect as a community. Food is how we express love in my family. When there's a wedding, we cook. When there's, you know, holidays, we cook. We invite one another over and share our food to just express terms of endearment. I've been cooking since I was five. My great grandmother uh, taught me how to cook when I was five years old. I started out making cookies and branched out there. So every time I cook, I think of her. My great grandmother's name was Cora, Cora Rowe. Um, she came here from Oklahoma and she came out to California after she learned to be a school teacher. When we got to California, it was, they wouldn't allow her to teach. So she learned, she had to be a maid. And in her being a maid, she had to share her, her love of food with the family that she took care of. So she taught me as well. Whenever I came over her house, she would teach me how to make cookies. It started out small and we just kept branching out to more and more things until we got to the big things like the roast and the greens and you know the main things. But she always taught me with patience and love. So this is why this cooking this means so much to me. My favorite thing about cooking with my um, mom and mother is, is that like I can spend more time with them instead of like doing my own thing because usually when it, whenever I do my own thing it, get, it gets kind of boring so then I try to check up on them. Today I did a mixture of turnip and mustard greens and I use mustard greens because they have a little spice. They're naturally a little bit more spicy and the terms are a little bit more tender. Basically started off with just regular bacon, regular pork bacon, and let that caramelize my onions and then in my garlic. And then I added smoked turkey to start my broth. And just put some, you know, let it, give it time to put some love in the pot. And then put my greens in on my mixture of greens. Our traditions are just that we love to cook on both sides of my family, my father's side, my mother's side. We love good food, good quality food, and to share a meal with each other is just, you know, it's the best thing ever.
I'm glad it's almost lunch. Um, the next food segment features Kathy Taylor, who is a colleague of mine and also an equity and inclusion officer for the city of Santa Monica. After we hear from Kathy, we'll go into another performance by African Soul International. Enjoy. In our family, I, I grew up uh, with two parents from two different, um, you know, areas. My dad is uh, black and my mom was from Nicaragua. And so we had always had like a melting pot of both like soul food and um, Nicaraguan food in our house. And so um, today we decided to make like a staple that we have normally like for breakfast, which is like from my mom's side, which is from Nicaragua, called gallo pinto. And so um, we both had like soul food, but also like the mix of both. But I feel like um, beans and rice is like something that everybody like kind of has as a staple in their house. And so I wanted to kind of share what we, how we make it at home. So my mom taught me um, how to make it. And um, I've also taught like my kids how to make it. So we like to have it at our house because a lot of times, you know, it's just a good like meal to just have around. Everybody can have beans and rice and it's kind of just comforting to have at home. For us, it's like kind of what brings us together. We all, we would all like for holidays and, um, and just even just in the morning having breakfast and things like that. We always would gather around and, and wake up in the morning. My mom and my dad would get in the kitchen, start cooking. Um, and it would be a mix between like like Southern, like black food and, and Nicaraguan food. So we would have anything from like pork chops and like biscuits and potatoes to like uh, beans and rice, which is like gallo pinto, which is kind of like what we've um, made. So some of my favorite memories of family and food is just being in the kitchen, cooking and like cracking jokes. You know, um, we're always like kind of teasing each other and things like that, but just coming together and actually like having those traditions of constantly like, it's kind of like, you know, Thanksgiving passed not too long ago, but in our house, it was a really big thing because you're all coming together and everybody's um, working together to make these dishes. Um, and it, it's funny because my mom came from Nicaragua, my dad was black, she learned a lot of uh, southern dishes, like, you know, greens, learned how to make mac and cheese and things like that. Um, and so we have like always have a combination of both cultures. I'm just really happy to be a part of, uh, of this event and Black History Month because it's, you know, it, it's so encompassing of everything, like the African diaspora is everywhere, you know, and that was something that I, I really, uh, fascinated about growing up is that there wasn't just black people here in the United States that they're all over the world you know and so that's why I kind of wanted to tie in both because um, I don't think that our, our kids are or we're raised with that um, that you know just that information that, that that is acknowledged openly you know and so I think that that's something that's very important to maybe tie in more and be more inclusive of different cultures and, and that representation throughout, you know, the world.
Last but certainly not least, we'll hear from Kathleen Benjamin, who is a private chef and an agape licensed spiritual uh, practitioner. We'll also hear from the McCowan family. We sat down with Mayor Pro Tem Kristen McCowan and her parents and her brother. Let's listen to see what they have to say. My family is originally from Nigeria by way of Alabama, and we ended up in Santa Monica. In 1946, my grandfather moved to Los Angeles to get a job at UCLA where he was the facilities manager, and he brought the rest of his children out here. What I want you to know about my family is that we are faith-based, family-based, self-determined, and we celebrate life. Confirmation bias says that you know, all blacks are this way or all blacks are that way. But in truth, if you're raised in a, with a solid foundation, you recognize that anything is possible by whatever means they are. If you're a singer, if you're an artist, if you're a poet, if you're a chef, that anything is possible. And you share that with everyone. I mean, that's what we came here to do is to share our riches and our possibility and our knowledge with, with the world. And that's what I'd love for people to recognize about the African-American family, that it's like an untapped treasure troll. I love the depth of my family and the longevity of my family. Um, when I was a kid, my grandmother used to say, just keep on living. I'd ask her a question, oh, grandma, this happened or that happened. She said, girl, just keep on living. So I learned that there's a process to life. There are levels of understanding that we can get that come through time. So I love about my family the determination, the creativity, and the love. Because as long as we have a solid foundation of love, we can do anything from that space. That I think there's an amazing opportunity here for Santa Monicans and for everyone in general that we can share culture, we can share traditions, we can share history. But there needs to be an opening. There needs to be a stage, an opportunity, so that we can share this richness. Because without that, without that there's something that's being lost and we don't want to lose anything. So let's open up, let's share, be willing, be receptive to what people have to offer in conversation and in sharing their traditions. We have a long history here in Santa Monica. That's another thing that African-Americans in Santa Monica may not know. We have a strong history and strong roots here for decades. And so even though we're celebrating it only in the last two years, the history that we have here is deep and long. So I'm honored to be part of it. And I trust that we can tell our stories in a way that we and others begin to understand that there's a belonging here. There's a belonging of the African American people and that the richness of the African American family only contributes to the richness of Santa Monica. My family has been in Santa Monica since the late 30s. My dad, um, was born in 46 here at St. John's, I believe, and or Santa Monica, Santa Monica, Santa Monica Hospital. And um, he was one of 12, and, and then I was, I was born in 80, and I am one of five. My dad's African-American uh, from Santa Monica. My mom is Italian-American from the East Coast, Connecticut. Very close family dynamic. Uh, my parents are still together, still live in the same house in which we uh, grew up. My, my parents were really accepting, um, and so I think that allowed all of their children to become whoever they were supposed to be. My family was, especially my parents, were always um, proactive in helping connect us to um, communities and groups and building relationships and um, building an extended family uh, so to speak, in, in Santa Monica. I identify as black, I identify as mixed, I identify as Italian. All of those things are who I am. And what's funny is, yes, my mom is, I, how, how do you identify? White, Italian, what? Italian. <laughs> Italian, I mean, she's Italian. Very aware of the fact that she had five black children and what that meant and what her responsibility was. And I was very grateful that I had the opportunity to raise my children here. I think it's it's a wonderful, wonderful place to reach. The diversity, you know, um, is is something you can't teach, and you can't offer that 
if you don't grow up in it. My grandmother owned a barbecue uh, restaurant for two or three years. Three. Three years on Main Street. Main Street. On Main Street. Main Street. Uh, Main Street was not gentrified. <laughs> it wasn't. It wasn't the Main Street that it is today, but it was still Main Street. Yeah. Grew up next to the freeway, um, on the south side of the freeway, in in the Pico neighborhood. And, um, you know, I always think that's really interesting because um, if you consider Santa Monica's history, there was a lot of displacement of people of color when the freeway was, was developed. And um, there are, you know, if you look at kind of resources and geography, there's kind of like the wider, wealthier neighborhoods in the north and com more communities of color uh, south of the freeway. And we actually grew up like literally living and existing on that boundary between uh, races and resources in the city. The black experience in Santa Monica for me was one of community because I knew that I came from a long line of Santa Monican. Well, there's been so much talk over the last several months about the importance of community conversations, courageous conversations. We're seeing that in the black agenda. I think you're seeing that in other communities of color here in Santa Monica. and. The city is really um, pushing for that. And so beyond February, beyond Black History Month, I think we'll continue to have conversations with one another to just learn more about each other. Um, I think that's the best thing any of us can do to be a good neighbor. We aren't the stereotypes. <laughs> we are um, uh, just like everyone else. And we want the, the same things. But we also have really um, unique experiences and, and uh, really challenging uh, histories. The reality is we, we have created a culture and embraced a culture of denial and moving past and around, really confronting like the realities of our history rather than move like directly addressing it, directly acknowledging it and moving through it. You know, we're moving like Let's move around this. Let's kind of talk about it. Let's, you know, 12 pages in the, in the social studies history book versus what really should be like 150 pages. Black people are realizing the importance of building a community and really activating that community to ensure that the legacy of black people is not lost. Uh, we, we, we're all one family here in Santa Monica and across our cities. And, and I think it's important that we start supporting laws and policies that are really uplifting rather than um, defeating for people. I'm almost 75, I was born here and I'm gonna die here. Uh, I, I, I don't know a better place in Santa Monica. Thank you for joining us for today's program. This is just the beginning of what's in store for the month. We encourage you to visit santamonica.gov to register and learn more about our other Black History Month events. We're so grateful to the families who are gracious enough to share their candid memories, their ties to the Santa Monica community, and their family food traditions. Thank you to Dr. Joel and African Soul International for a wonderful performance. I'd like to thank our sponsors who made this event possible today, the city manager's office and the Office of Sustainability and the Environment. I'd like to give a special shout out to Marcus Tad Williams of City TV and also Jordan Ellis, who did an amazing job shooting and editing these videos under an extremely tight deadline. A special thank you to the Black History Month Committee of staff and community members who made a lot of things happen behind the scenes. This concludes our program and we hope to see you at the next event.